Good evening and welcome to CIFES Africa's webinar on COVID-19 vaccines. I'm your host, Stephen Lang. Vaccination has been a cornerstone of the world's battle against many diseases. Polio, measles, mumps, typhoid, TB, diphtheria, and more vaccines have saved millions of lives around the globe. In South Africa, vaccination has been a routine part of the lives of many South Africans since birth. Now, we are pinning our hopes on a new set of vaccines to help the world battle arguably the most consequential global health crisis in recent history, COVID-19. Recent news reports indicate that a number of vaccines are showing promising success rates in combating this virus. But where do South Africans fit into this picture? Discussions about bringing vaccines to combat COVID-19 are justifiably multidimensional. Today, we welcome experts who can help us not only answer, but help frame the pivotal questions about the health, ethical, scientific, and policy dimensions South Africans face in accessing this new medication. Let me now introduce the members of this panel. Professor Ames Dye. Professor Dye is a leading authority in bioethics. She is the founder and past director of the Steve Biko Center for Bioethics at the Faculty of Health Services at the University of the Witwatersrand. She is a specialist ethicist at the Office of the President and CEO of the South African Medical Research Council. In addition, she is the vice chairperson of the International Bioethics Committee of UNESCO. She also serves on the Ministerial Advisory Committee for COVID-19 Vaccines. Dr. Gautam Kalyatanda. Dr. Kalyatanda is an, an Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease and Global Medicine at the University of Florida, Gainesville in the United States. He specializes in seeing patients with infectious diseases. He works with many non-governmental organizations in rural India, and together with South African, British, American, and Indian scientists and healthcare workers, has led a successful multicultural initiative around the sharing and dissemination of best practices on COVID-19. Professor Shabir Mahdi. Professor Mahdi is Professor of Vaccinology at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg and co-founder and co-director of the South African Leadership Initiative for vaccinology expertise. He is a director of the South African Medical Research Council, Vaccines and Infectious Diseases Analytical Research Unit, and is research chair in Vaccine Preventable Diseases of the Department of Science and Innovation. He is the, leading the first two COVID-19 vaccine studies being undertaken in Africa. Professor Jeffrey Mpahlele, Professor Mpahlele is the Vice President for Research at the South African Medical Research Council. His research publications cover epidemiology, vaccination control of infectious diseases, and strengthening immunization services and policies. He is a member of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19 vaccines. Welcome to the four members of our panel who are going to help us understand the multiple factors influencing the rollout of vaccinations against COVID-19. There are many questions on this very topical issue and members of the audience will be invited to send in questions using the Q&A function. I request our panelists to do the impossible, give complete answers, but be brief. In the first round, I will direct questions at individual panelists, but of course, you are all welcome to chip in at appropriate moments. Our first question is for Professor Mahdi. Right now, global news organizations are reporting on several front-runner vaccines in the battle against COVID-19. In your view, which of these are showing the most promise for South Africa as a vaccine? Professor Mahdi. So good evening, Steve. Uh, so Steve, as you correctly pointed out, there are three vaccine candidates that have now reported on efficacy as well as safety. Uh, two of the three candidates, unfortunately, are unlikely to be deployable in South Africa for different reasons. The, and both of these uh, vaccines employ new technology known as nucleotide acid-based vaccines, uh, where they basically use a messenger RNA 
to develop a vaccine, which is really novel technology. Now, the reason why these two vaccines are unlikely to become available anytime soon in South Africa, firstly relates to the one being funded for Operation Warp Speed. And that is a vaccine that's been developed by Moderna. And the conditions of the funding to Moderna is that Moderna would only be able to export vaccine after the demands of the US market has been met. So unfortunately, that vaccine is not going to become available, probably at least until 2022. The Pfizer vaccine, which also uses a messenger RNA technology, uh, basically is a vaccine which unfortunately in its current formulation needs to be stored at minus 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, neither in the public or the private health sector in South Africa are facilities equipped to store vaccines at that sort of ultra low temperature. Those sort of facilities might be available in academic centers, but certainly in terms of mass deployment of the vaccine, in its current formulation, the Pfizer vaccine will not be uh, deployable in South Africa either. So the only vaccine which stands a reasonable chance in terms of being introduced uh, sometime soon in South Africa is the AstraZeneca vaccine, which can be stored at two to eight degrees Celsius, which has got a half a shelf life of at least about six months. In addition to which, with the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, the ability to scale up a production far exceeds the combined ability to scale up production of the messenger RNA vaccines. For both of the messenger RNA vaccines, it's estimated that they would only be able to produce 70 million doses by the end of this year, and roughly about 2 billion doses by the end of uh, 2021. The AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, the estimates are to be able to produce 200 million doses by the end of 2020, and up to 3 billion doses by the end of 2021. In addition to which the substantial differences in terms of the pricing of these vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine is approximately one tenth of the cost of the Moderna vaccine and in fact also the Pfizer vaccine now. Uh, so it's coming in at about $3 per dose. So putting all of these factors together in terms of deployability, in terms of the timeliness of being able to access uh, adequate uh, num quantity of vaccine, uh, as well as in terms of the pricing and what would probably become available outside of high income countries in the near future. Right now, between this, across these three vaccines, the only one that really has got any chance of being deployed in a country such as South Africa and many other sub Saharan African countries is the AstraZeneca vaccine. It, it seems as though you still have some doubts about whether we're actually going to be seeing this in the uh, near to medium term future. Unfortunately for South Africa, very much the case. Uh, and part of the reason for that is the delay in terms of planning on the part of government uh, to be able to access vaccine at an early stage. So government has been slightly delayed in terms of paying a deposit to the COVAX facility, which has got its issues of its own in terms of South Africa being an upper middle income country and what is expected of South Africa in terms of contributing to the COVAX facility to be able to access vaccine. Unfortunately, government, to my knowledge, hasn't been too intensive in terms of trying to arrange bilateral agreements, including with AstraZeneca or with any of the other manufacturers. So where that leaves us right now is that much of the initial supply of vaccine from all of these three companies to a large extent has already been bespoken for. Uh, as you might know, about 51% uh, of vaccine that's gonna be developed right through to the end of 2021 has already been pre-ordered and purchased in a sense by 13, by countries, high income countries that represent 13% of the global population. And a country such as India as an example has also in advance made deals to, uh, to consume a large amount of the vaccine that in fact will be uh, manufactured in India. So the more that we delay, the lower down in the, in the packing order that we go in terms of being able to access vaccine. And that's unfortunately where we find ourselves right now, are largely because of an issue related to planning in terms of accessing vaccine timelessly and large enough quantities and at the, at the negotiable price. And that shouldn't be, have been the case because South Africa is the only African country on the continent where there are four vaccine trials that have been done. And in fact, as part of the agreement with three of those vaccine studies, it actually places South Africa in a favorable position to be able to negotiate with those companies for early access at, a, at an affordable price. Uh, thank you, Professor Maria. You've raised a couple of very important issues that I think we're going to have to come back to a little bit later in this webinar. But let me cross now to um, Professor Dai and ask a couple of questions about what are the ethical considerations 
involved in bringing a new vaccines into, into the country. Most South Africans have already had vaccines for a number of other diseases, but what is the situation in terms of bringing a new vaccine into the community? Thank you. Uh, good evening, Steve, and good evening to the participants in the webinar. I think what we need to understand is that what we've had, what we have, and what has worked well in our country thus far is the pediatric vaccine program. We have not had such a vac vaccination program for adults. And also it's important to understand that this is not just any vaccine, but it's a vaccine that has been produced as a rapid response to the pandemic. And just to quote Tedros from the WHO, what he said was that no vaccines in history have been developed as rapidly as these. So the scientific community has set a new standard for vaccine development. Key, I would say, in terms of ethics are safety, efficacy, country readiness in terms of our system so that vaccines can be administered efficiently. But I also think key is public acceptability and hence uptake of the vaccine. Currently, there's quite a bit of vaccine hesitancy. And you know, there are studies that have shown that within South Africa, uh, and this was already as early on as uh, in um, uh, early October, uh, vaccine um, uptake in terms of South Africa, there were, you know, uh, uh, 64, it was only 64% of those that were surveyed that said they would be happy to take a vaccine. And of these 64, there was still a lot of hesitancy because 29% were very happy, comfortable, and the rest actually fell, uh, you know, responded by saying, well, we're not too sure. So there is a lot of he uh, vaccine hesitancy and it's something that is a huge problem in ethics. Some of the reasons for this vaccine hesitancy are, I mean, it's the novelty of the disease and this unusually rapid speed of the vaccine development. Um, there's mistrust in science and in health experts by some. And unfortunately you find mistrust messages getting more airspace on social media than positive messages. There's also, I think some emotional detachment because of fatigue as a result of this infodemic that's been, I would say just, just as bad as the pandemic in terms of plaguing. Uh, the globe. And uh, also the uncontrollable nature and the prolonged uncertainty of the pandemic also adds to this fat fatigue and exhaustion. We've also seen politicization of the vaccine and its safety and efficacy standards by some groups. Uh, there's conspiracy theories by anti-vaxxers, and I'm sure most of us have seen uh, the, uh, the videos that went around on YouTube every time, uh, you know, there was some positive results being, um, you know, announced on the different vaccines. Within South Africa itself, what we find is also, and the study showed it quite well, it was a World, World Economic Forum study. It showed that distrust in the vaccines actually mirrored a lack of trust in public health institutions. With 32% of South Africans saying that they had no trust in our hospitals and our clinics, and it's really understandably so. Uh, those so are quite serious statistics. They're absolutely scary. But whatever the vaccine programs that we do have, um, the program that we do have now for COVID-19, I think there are key objectives of that program that we need to look at. And that is to decrease mortality and morbidity, and also to minimize disruptions 
to society and to our economy. We've had the experience in terms of what's happened when we went in full lockdown and we don't want to go that way again. You know, our World Bank, uh, the World Bank actually has stated uh, in its predictions that uh, Africa is going to see its first recession in 25 years as a result of this pandemic. Yeah. Uh, let's just quickly go back to the, um, the the ethics of introducing the new vaccine. Is it viable or is it conceivable that the government could oblige citizens to take a vaccine? Could it be a, a legal requirement? So, currently there is no legal requirement and no regulation has come forth in terms of making it an absolute, uh, absolutely mandatory. Uh, and when we look at our constitution, our Bill of Rights, uh, section 12 affirms everyone's right to bodily uh, integrity, bodily and psychological integrity. So this would mean that if one has to take the vaccine, one has to make an informed decision with regard taking the vaccine. Um, this right can be limited if it's necessary for the good of society. For the greater good, for the greater yes. good of society. Greater good of society. And here we look at section 36 of our Bill of Rights, which allows for limitations on condition that the limitation is reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society. And I'd like to believe that we are a democratic society in South Africa. And if for any reason this right has to be limited, uh, one would have to make a constitutional argument for it. But I don't even think we need to go as far as that. You know, if we have early community engagement programs, if our, you know, if our state actors and our decision, uh, decision makers can reach out into the community with and engage community on with positive messages and positive interactions on why the vaccine is necessary. Yes. If we have positive messages uh, that go out that could counter the misinformation that we see floating around. This would really be of assistance. And I'm sure that many, you know, many of those that express hesitancy might actually, um, you know, turn around and be more positive. Okay. So I think what you're saying is that the government needs to take into consideration this vaccine hesitancy that we were talking about and then also dis disseminate a, a positive message, uh, proper communication about what is actually happening. And with that, I'd, I'd like to cross to Professor Mpahlele, who is on the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19. And this, this body advises the government about how the rollout of vaccination should go. Um, Professor Mpahlele, if you don't mind explaining us a little bit more about what is the, the actual role of this committee? How are they actually devising policy criteria for the rollout? Uh, Professor Mpahlele, your microphone's muted. Uh, thank you. Um, good you afternoon, go. Stephen. Good afternoon. Um, so, as you rightly say, um, the, 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 the MEC uh, is about vaccines. Uh, so the most important thing is really for the advisory body um, to come up with uh, a framework uh, which will be used uh, in terms of um, uh, selecting the most appropriate vaccines uh, for South Africa, especially you know, for use in the public sector. Um, you heard uh, from the previous speakers uh, that uh, perhaps not all vaccines would be suitable uh, for our setting uh, because of the many reasons that uh, have been mentioned. So part of the, um, the, 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 the job 
uh, for this uh, MEC uh, is really to come up with a framework uh, which will assist and guide uh, in terms of um, choosing the appropriate vaccines uh, for the country. Uh, Professor Madi suggested that perhaps the government hasn't been quite on its toes about dealing with negotiations for acquiring vaccines. Uh, how do you respond to that? Well, it's difficult to speak for the government. Um, I can only say that, um, you know, the role of the advisory body, uh, obviously, is to advise uh, the government. And uh, the government uh, has got, uh, you know, its own role, uh, which means... Um, they have to make sure that um, they procure the vaccines. Uh, if uh, there has been an advisory on which vaccines are most suitable for the country and, um, and, 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 and do everything that is related to uh, purchasing of the vaccines and making the vaccines available uh, to the South African citizens. So it's not necessarily you know, the, the, the job of um, the advisory body. So it's difficult to okay. really talk to the government. Okay. So let me understand that um, the advisory committee is giving advice, but then the government is not necessarily accepting all the advice or not acting on the advice. Is that correct? At this stage, um, nothing is finalized. Uh, right. I think uh, the advisory body is still at work uh, with a number of uh, recommendations. And uh, when the recommendations are made available, uh, obviously um, only then, you know, uh, the government will act. Uh, so it, it will be unfair to say that, um, you know, the government is uh, not doing anything at this point in time. Okay. Uh, from okay, the well, advisory. Yes, it's an advisory committee. It doesn't necessarily have to uh, act on your advice. Um, then what are the policy criteria that the advisory committee uses in, in selecting vaccines and selecting who will actually uh, be, who will actually receive the vaccines? Yeah, so I, I just um, indicated that um, it's still a work in progress. Um, there are certainly um, some, some, some recommendations that have been developed, uh, but um, obviously these recommendations haven't been made uh, available um, to uh, in, in a final um, uh, uh, format uh, to to the government, and um, I can say that um, you know when it comes to the criteria and uh, maybe who should receive the vaccine, uh, I don't think um, it requires um, it, it requires a lot of science, uh, although there must be science behind it. Um, we know that uh, in most countries, um, the priority uh, groups uh, tend to be uh, those who are at the highest risk uh, for infection. And uh, this include healthcare workers. Uh, they include um, um, essential workers. And, um, and, and they also include uh, people with uh, comorbidities and the elderly. Uh, so you shouldn't be surprised uh, if um, you know, those groups are actually included um, as uh, part of... Um, you know, the groups that should receive the vaccine first. Yeah, that seems to be international best practice at the moment, doesn't it? Um, Dr. Dr. Kalyatanda, I'd like to ask you about your international experiences. You've been leading an international group of healthcare workers in conversation for the past few months, sharing perspectives. What do you expect will be the common challenges, questions, that healthcare workers will face in their role in administering the vaccines, looking at it now from an international perspective. Right. Um, uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, and, and thank you for having me on the CIFIS in this webinar. It truly is an honor. Um, so it was interesting. Um, a pandemic, by its very definition, involves the entire world. And, and we, we saw early on um, might have to do with a lot to do with lockdowns, um, you know, people were becoming rather insular. And we thought um, that there was a definite need um, to, to collaborate globally, just to learn from one another. This was an interesting um, um, time. Um, for, for, for as long as I know, um, uh, the, the, the West um, presumed that infectious diseases were going to be 
um, relegated to Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And here we were, countries in Asia, Latin America, and Africa worrying about this infection that, that or at least, you know, China initially, but then later that was coming on from Europe, at least to Africa and, and other places as well. Uh, so, so I think the West um, found itself in, in a different position where, and, 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 and even countries in the, the developing countries themselves um, were learning from what, what didn't work in, in the West. And, and there were quite a few there. Um, so, and, and that was the reason why we thought that this, there was a need to involve a multidisciplinary, uh, multi-country collaboration to tackle this pandemic. So um, we, we had uh, participants from about 34 countries, 35 different disciplines, various, you know, and, and we did this on a weekly basis, uh, not just to educate healthcare, health workers, but, but even other disciplines which were closely connected with, with this pandemic as, as things progressed. Right. Uh, lots of NGOs as well. So, so coming to your question about, about the common challenges, I think um, one of the biggest problems that, that we did face and that we are going to face is the infodemic, right? Or misinformation that, 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 is, that is going to be seen. Uh, it was already present and it's, I think, uh, multiplied uh, many fold with, with um, the the uh, now rollout of vaccinations, um, social media. There's lots of posts about why someone shouldn't be taking vaccines, and now this is a problem um, that will be faced by the healthcare workers, uh, especially in developing countries, because these are the you know last mile healthcare workers who are going to convince people to take these vaccines, and here they are having to face these questions, and partly because we we don't have a lot of information about these vaccines just just because you know considering the timeline so again it is probably to equip the last mile healthcare workers with the information that's needed the training that's needed to answer some of these questions and on a separate footing to actually tackle the misinformation that that i think is being propagated through social media right so i think even when you come into this whole sphere of people not wanting vaccine, the anti-vaxxers and everyone else, there's going to be people who uh, have decided to take it as most surveys have shown, right? Um, Europe, different parts of the world as well. Now there are some who will not take it and might be difficult convincing them, but there's, but there's some people in the middle who, who I think can be, you know, these are the people who need some solid facts, um, some information about the science behind these vaccines. And I think it is, um, it is um, needed from all scientists and healthcare workers to kind of address this misinformation through proper science, through those same mediums or platforms. So I think the challenge is really, I think, um, you know, the, the kind of misinformation um, and also, um, um, uh, you, you, you know the, the the last mile healthcare and the lack of a lot of information about these vaccines that these healthcare workers would would have to face. Thank you, um, and and also talking about uh, the international perspective, the virus doesn't respect borders. It can cross very easily from one country to the other, as we've all seen. But at the same time, some countries are acting quite. Uh, protective of their borders, trying to prevent others from having access to their benefits, etc. And it's also in some respects showing a kind of uh, divide between the richer countries who've been able to buy ahead, they've been able to purchase uh, stocks even from next year of the vaccine. Is, is this is this race for the virus, is the race for vaccinations further dividing the country into the rich and poor? Oh, absolutely, right? I mean, you know, there is enough information and there's enough knowledge to say. I mean, again, I don't have the numbers, but I think the majority of the vaccines are going to, um, you know, uh, pop, well, to, to the developed countries and the rich countries. And so uh, there's, there's going to be a huge want of vaccines and it might take many, many years for, for, 
all these countries to get their entire populations um, uh, vaccinated. I was just reading today, I think it might have been The Guardian, where there was an article about how um, Canada has placed orders for vaccines five times the size of their population. So we, we're getting into these um, realms of uh, vaccine hoarding, vaccine nationalism. So for for, for me personally, as, as, we, as we kind of create this global network and collaboration to fight this pandemic, it's kind of um, awkward um, to, to, to look at my, you know, my, my collaborators from, from different parts of the world uh, who need this vaccine probably a lot more than we do and say, yes, because it's where I live and where, or probably where you were born that decides um, how soon how soon you get the vaccine. So definitely, I mean, you know, the, the, it, it, it's, um, it's, it's very obvious, I think, that some countries are going to um, get most of these vaccines in the, in the short term, at least. So it, 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 we call, it, it's kind of an awkward situation, yes. Yes, and, and even as there's a, a risk of a divide between the rich and the poor countries, uh, perhaps one of our other panelists might want to comment on uh, whether this is creating a divide, a rift between the rich and the poor within a country. Uh, in South Africa, we have a private healthcare sector and a, a public healthcare sector, and the, they have access to very different uh, resources. What is going to happen in, in this country? Um, Prof Professor Dai, would you like to come in on that? Yes, so when we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, we've just heard about vaccine nationalism, and that works against um, global equitable access. But we also need to look at in-country equitable access. And our realities in South Africa is that we have one health system, but it's two tier. And you have the 20% that will be able to afford and the rest that can't. And from my experience as a general practitioner, as a, a, practice, a, a gynecologist in private practice, what I can say is even those uh, individuals that do not have medical aids actually go, many of them start off in the private sector. And why? Because of the distrust and the, the unhappiness experienced in terms of public sector uh, health care. So, so you will find many more than those on medical aids uh, would want to purchase the vaccines, but unfortunately not all can afford. Um, the rollout, you know, the rollout is planned for, I would think, everyone in South Africa. It should be for everyone in South Africa. But I think it would concentrate more on the public sector. Now, I want us to take a step back and look at when we went into level five lockdown. What happened? Suddenly, people were locked in little homes or little rooms with no access to food, water, sanitizer, soap, etc. What did South African society do? South African society got together. This, for me, is, is epic in terms of solidarity. And our South African society, in solidarity, got together and addressed the needs of the poor while government was still thinking about what to do. And what I would suggest is we pay, those of us that can afford to pay for our vac uh, vaccines, we paid for our vaccines because the kitty is so limited. Okay, we're looking at the, um, there was a press release on the 4th of December by the Department of Health where it, um, and in this press release, it, it states that it's uh, committed to, to purchase 10% uh, 
uh, uh, you know, for its, uh, sorry, to purchase from the COVAX facility for 10% of its population. Now, the down payment for that is 300, over 327 million rands. That's just the down payment. And what, that, uh, what the um, article further states is that the full price is over 2 billion just for 10%. Now, if all our money goes into the vaccines, what's going to happen to other healthcare? What's going to happen to TB, HIV, et cetera, and all the other social amenities, non-health social amenities? So I think we need to get together in solidarity. I really think that it's important that the private sector and the public sector talk to each other and collaborate. The uh, the uh, the Department of Health. Um, announcement stated that it would uh, encourage collaboration between uh, private and public health sectors in terms of moving forward. And I just hope that this is going to, to be the way we, we move forward. I think we've learned lots of lessons. Yes, and yes. And, and there's some very important things that you have to say there. I'd be interested to hear how um, the Ministerial Advisory Committee uh, is going to tackle these issues uh, between the private and the public health sectors. Uh, I wonder if Professor Mbacheli would like to comment on that. Um, yes, Stephen. Um, you, you just stepped off from another member of an advisory body. Um, so I hope uh, this is not unfair to me, <laughs> but uh, clearly um, what um, AIMS has been discussing um, is, um, is an aspirational goal, and uh, we hope that uh, there is going to be a collaboration uh, between the public and the private uh, sector. Um, obviously, um, it's still early stages. Uh, we don't know how things will pan out. Uh, once the vaccines become available uh, in South Africa and they are registered by a regulatory authority. So I don't think there's anyone with the details at the moment uh, in terms of how private and public uh, can collaborate. Uh, but clearly, um, you know, if there is any area that the private and public could collaborate on uh, is the fact that the private sector has got uh, medical aid uh, so they do have uh, benefits and uh, you can imagine a situation where maybe all healthcare workers who are prioritized for vaccination, for example, can pay uh, these vaccines with the medical aid benefits because most of them have bought uh, medical aid benefits. Uh, that will help to free uh, the money uh, to buy additional doses for the poor. And uh, that is just one area where collaboration could actually work. But another area is really in terms of uh, distribution uh, of the vaccine, uh, because um, we know that uh, there are private sectors that are really good um, in delivering vaccines and administering vaccines. So if there are vaccines available and uh, the public sector is not able uh, to reach everybody, uh, clearly the, the private sector would be an ideal area uh, to, go up, to collaborate with. Thank you for that. Uh, Professor Mahdi, um, let's talk a little bit about safety concerns. We've got these three front runners that have come out and everyone's talking about them a lot in the media. And you mentioned that uh, only one would be uh, suitable for, for South Africa. Um, but they are running out um, vaccines in other countries as well. Like, for example, in Russia, they use the what they call the Sputnik vaccine. And in China, they seem to have some kind of vaccine as well. How, how certain are we of safety concerns about possible vaccines that we could use here in South Africa? Yeah, so Steve... Um... The bottom line is that we shouldn't shut our door to any vaccine, but at the same time, any vaccine that is adopted in South Africa needs to go through rigorous, rigorous scrutiny 
and needs to check the two important boxes. And the one is that the vaccine has been shown to be safety in properly designed studies, uh, which usually requires tens of thousands of individuals to be vaccinated rather than two or 300 individuals. And also that the vaccine is proven to be efficacious. So those two are absolute non-negotiables. It would be irresponsible of South Africa just by virtue of possibly being able to get vaccine from Russia or China to decide on introducing a vaccine without the evidence that those vaccines are safe and efficacious. So irrespective of whether one other regulated authority has decided to license the vaccine, it needs to stand up to scientific scrutiny and it needs to stand up for scrutiny by the local regulatory authorities. And I would really hope that a multiple number of other role players are successful with a vaccine, irrespective of where they come from, be it China, be it uh, India, be it uh, Brazil, or uh, wherever the company is, because for us to be able to get adequate quantity of vaccine in the near future, we actually need more than three companies to be successful with their development, uh, or else we'll end up uh, being pretty much in a situation that we were in when the swine flu pandemic occurred in 2009. And that is the only country in the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa to actually eventually receive the swine flu vaccine was South Africa, except it had only received the vaccine after the pandemic had passed, which is not particularly useful. So it does come to a, as a concern to me to hear that, uh, as an example, government hasn't really decided yet which vaccine to go for, when right now we are pretty much at the bottom of the pecking order in terms of being able to gain access to any of the three vaccines if we haven't made that sort of uh, negotiation, if we haven't already undertaken, made that decision, and if, if we haven't already engaged in a negotiation. So the earlier question that you asked about the private public sector divide and the possibility of inequity, it's largely unfortunately an academic discussion in South Africa, because there's no vaccine is going to become available in South Africa in 2021 through the private sector without government actually being the ones to expedite the, the ability of the country to gain access to the vaccine. So I fully agree there needs to be a public-private partnership in terms of the funding model, but there's, no, there's not going to be any differential in terms of access to a COVID-19 vaccine uh, before the end of 2021, simply because the South African market, market is simply tiny and it's not in the interest of any manufacturer to go through the regulatory processes of getting a vaccine registered in South Africa for a small fraction it's served by the private sector. So like I said, it would be great to have that discussion, but right now it's an academic discussion simply because there simply isn't any vaccine that's currently earmarked for the South African market, which is the major concern. You, you brought uh, vaccine trials to South Africa. Don't these trials give South Africa any uh, advantage in um, understanding the effectiveness of the vaccine? and perhaps giving, getting access to it. Absolutely. In fact, the negotiations that we had with the funders of the studies was such that it actually puts South Africa in prime position to be able to access these vaccines at meaningful quantities at a very competitive price should these vaccines be shown to be effective. But it's completely in the hands of government as to how they want to engage with those manufacturers. It's not for the researchers to enter into agreement with the manufacturers for South Africa to gain access. So South Africa is in an extremely fortunate position in that it's probably able to leverage vaccine from AstraZeneca, from uh, as well as possibly the Johnson & Johnson and the Novavax vaccines, which hopefully will report on efficacy data in the course of the next four to eight weeks. So we're in a highly competitive position, but unfortunately it's about government and it's about inertia on the part of government that is really putting us on a back foot in terms of being able to be competitive to be able to access vaccine which we should be prioritized for simply by virtue of having contributed to the clinical development of these vaccines. Can we manufacture these vaccines in South Africa? Uh, that unfortunately is a pipe dream. Uh, to, South Africa hasn't manufactured a vaccine since 1992 when the only manuf vaccine manufacturing facilities were dismantled. Since then, uh, there is a public-private partnership that has set up a facility, but in the past 25 years, that facility has not manufactured a single vaccine. For a vaccine to be manufactured from scratch, even if the other companies provide the IP rights to that vaccine, is not something that is going to occur in a period of 25 weeks or even 25 months for that matter. It is a technically challenging process. And in fact, the regulatory authority in South Africa 
doesn't have the framework to accredit manufacturers for vaccine production simply because it hasn't happened. So yes, we can manufacture vaccine eventually, but it's gonna be particularly unuseful for us to start vaccine, manufacturing vaccines after the pandemic has passed and after more than two thirds of the population have become infected to the virus. I'd like to open the next question to the whole panel. Uh, and it's about misinformation, fake news. We've heard a lot about that and many South Africans and people in other countries as well seem to be taking in this misinformation. What I find very difficult to understand is why are people generating such a misinformation? Misinform and secondly, why do people believe it? Um, who would like to answer that? I would lay the blame on the part of Donald Trump. Yes. <laughs> Um, I, well, yes, Dr. Kalyan, Kalyan So, so um, I, I think there are four groups. I think, uh, you know, based on some studies, there are four groups that, you know, or four subgroups that, that really contribute to a lot of these misinformation. There are some people who are truly, you know, believe in this. Then um, there are obviously in, in, in platforms, uh, social media platforms, there's a large number of people who actually sell their products. So it's marketing gimmicks. So, you know, they kind of um, have these um, um, ways, you know, so, so, they, so they benefit from that. So, so they would market it, right? So, and, and, and so, so it, it, it depends. So it's just not, uh, it's just not, I, I don't think it's a homogeneous group. There can be different people at play with all this misinformation that comes out. But I think the most important thing is, to, um, to, to counter that and not react, right? I, I think the problem is when you react. The, the, I think what we should really be doing is counter it with proper science. And, um, and I think this is where governments can play a huge role in being that medium through which science is communicated to the population very well. Uh, there are some groups that, that are shown to believe in these kind of uh, misinformations a lot more than others. And studies have shown it's usually the elderly, marginalized societies, and they might have other reasons to believe uh, these conspiracy theories. And I think those should be addressed as well. But I think the main, uh, main focus should be on um, proper science being, um, being um, uh, you know, being being available for for all for through through these mediums itself. Let's see. Okay. Um, now I'm taking some questions from some members of the audience. Uh, people can write in questions if they use the Q and A function and put questions through. And I've had a couple of questions here about the timeline of the rollout of the vaccines. Uh, people say there are unnecessary delays and other people are also concerned about perhaps this is happening too fast. Um, and also the, the issues on timeline seem to be very vague. People are very vague. What, what is the problem? What is holding the, a definitive timeline up? Maybe I can start and then yes. I can join. Um, <clears throat> I, th I think the anxiety in terms of uh, the rollout of the vaccine is, um, is justifiable uh, because we're dealing with the pandemic. But the reality is that um, at the moment, uh, we don't have any vaccine licensed uh, for use in the public. And uh, those who are following the news from, from UK, um, you know that uh, even UK being the first um, country to introduce the, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine is using the vaccine. Uh, as part of emergency use. Uh, so at the moment, we don't have any licensed uh, COVID-19 vaccine. All the countries are doing, they are preparing to roll out uh, the vaccines. And I don't think um, there is a delay that uh, people think there is. Um, obviously, it would be better uh, if um, the plan is already in place, uh, that um, if, 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 if your vaccine is available, um, you know, we know what to do. Uh, but clearly, I just want to despair 
uh, the fact that um, you know people feel that uh, there is a delay and um, and and uh, you know there is just um, a process uh, which is uh, protracted and maybe there is unwillingness uh, from other quarters uh, to introduce the vaccine. So I just want to put that clear. Thanks. Okay. And the vagueness or the unsureness about the, the timeline causes a lot of people, particularly here in South Africa, to be suspicious of corruption. Um, is there a possibility that there's um, corruption involved in, in making the, the vaccines available? And to what extent are there reliable, transparent, clear policies to ensure that there isn't corruption. We even had these incidents of corruption with um, protective equipment. What can be done about that? What, why, why should we be worried about that instead of just worried about being healthy? Perhaps Professor Dai would like to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, we can have all the policies in the world. Yes. But corrupt will get their way. Uh, so what I think we should be reassured about in terms of the vaccines and, um, and the fact that, you know, it's, been, it's taken some time uh, in terms of even making a decision with regard to whether or not we commit to COVAX, and I'll refer us back to the statement that the Department of Health put out on the 4th of December. You know, the contracts had to be studied. And, and I just want to say, from the reading that I've been doing on COVAX and the interaction that I've had with other colleagues, COVAX isn't that in, uh, angel it's been made out to be. COVAX is one, you know, one uh, initiative whereby we can look at accessing vaccines. Why? I've been told that it's it like a, a negotiating tool more than actually a company, is that correct? Yes, it's... Um, it's an alliance spearheaded by the uh, WHO, and it includes Gavi and CEPI. These are two other initiatives. And basically, what they, you know, the plan has been to promote global equitable access to vaccines for all nations and to counter nationalism in terms of vaccines. Now, when you look at that, uh, and you look at the countries that have signed into COVAX, the signatories, the UK, the EU, Canada, so they've signed in into this pact, but they've gone and eroded the pact by going and striking up bilaterals as well, which means less into the pot of COVAX. And then when you look at the financing mechanisms as well, in terms of COVAX. South Africa is ranked as a middle income country, yes, but it's, you know, in terms of what we pay is going to be the same as that of uh, prices in Japan, the UK, et cetera, and we in junk status. And then also in terms of the volumes that are going to be given out, you know, somewhat obscure. So, so that's the one thing. But uh, in also in terms of the contract itself and in terms of um, the various checks and balances that we have in the country with, you know, this is where I would think, um, one actually, uh, you know, had to consider whether or not there would be irregular expenditure. And so if Treasury has been doing its job and it's been doing its job such that it wants to prevent problems based on what we've actually experienced thus far, then I think we should also, you know, uh, give 
you know, our government is not an angel, but I think we also need to give government credit in terms of why it's actually been moving this route. The problem though, in terms of why we're asking all these questions is, you know, we need those messages to come forth. And the, you know, the press release on the 4th of, uh, of uh, December, I'm sure most people haven't even read, you know, it's, it's just on the website and that's it. Uh, I mean, in this press release, it also talks about, uh, you know, the fact that it's not restricted to COVAX and it's going to be looking at uh, other industry players as well. So it can move towards the most cost effective route going forward. Thank you. Uh, just, I mean, just, let's accept yes. that. You know? South Africa is falling in the middle between uh, the emerging countries and, and the developed countries. I'd like to read another uh, question here from one of the members of the audience. It says that uh, vaccinated people show adverse reactions or sometimes show adverse reactions. How would the manufacturer and government take care of such people? What is the advice to people with, with existing autoimmune condition? In other words, what about people who perhaps shouldn't take a, a, a vaccine? What can be done about them? Open to the panel. So Steve, in some countries, what they've got is they've got a compensation fund and especially vaccines are sort of somewhat mandatory. Uh, the country's actually compelled to have a compensation fund where they would uh, sort of cover the costs uh, in terms of any serious adverse events. Uh, but that being said, I think we just need to be careful about not overcalling the whole issue of adverse events, uh, including with people with autoimmune disease. Uh, right now, based on the evidence that has come out from these three studies uh, that have been reported on, including one that was now being peer reviewed and reported on in the Lancet just yesterday, is that there haven't been any indications of serious adverse events. So all vaccines induce some sort of adverse event, uh, but it's usually a mild self-limiting infection uh, illness a sort of pain at the site of injection or some mild fever. And in fact, that's good news because it tells us the immune system is actually mounting a response against the vaccine, which is exactly what we require. So in terms of uh, what can happen, like I said, government can put up a compensation fund and many high income countries, including Australia as an, as an example of a country that has got a mandatory vaccine policy for children, they actually got a compensation fund that they would compensate for any uh, serious adverse events that's eventually the, attributed to the vaccine. What we also need to understand is that in a context of uh, millions of people getting vaccinated, it's not going to be surprising that some people are going to fall ill very soon after vaccination, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the vaccine has caused that person to become ill. The only way to really determine whether vaccines are safe or not is to do this sort of randomized controlled trials that have been done that includes large number of people that eventually you can sort of compare two equally divided groups in terms of their side effects that might or might not be experienced. And if the side effects are higher in a vaccinated group, then we can attribute that to vaccination. So we need to be careful in terms of calling any event that occurs after someone is vaccinated as being related to vaccine. As an example, someone that gets a shot and walks onto the street and gets knocked down by a motor vehicle, that obviously is not related to the vaccine. And someone can get a heart attack the next day after they get a vaccine, but that does not mean the vaccine has actually caused that. So the manner in which we actually think about adverse events, especially when millions of people are going to be vaccinated over a short period of time, we need, need to be really guarded in terms of the messaging and how those sort of attributions are made. Thank you. Um, I've got another question here. Uh, the question is, why is the South African government not communicating with South Africans about when we will get a vaccine? The, the, that's the question. But first of all, uh, do we agree? Is the government communicating properly about vaccines or, or not? And if not, why not? Yeah, so Steve, I'm going to slightly, unfortunately, defer with Prof. Mapashlele. And the reason I'm going to defer is that uh, the reason a country such as South Korea, as an example, can indicate that by June of next year, in fact, sooner, 
they're going to vaccinate 50 of the 54 million people in South Korea. The reason they can actually make that statement yesterday was simply they have planned in terms of when they're gonna get vaccine, from who they're gonna get vaccine, how much vaccine they're going to get. And that planning didn't take place the day before. That planning took place, in fact, probably six months ago. And the same thing, the reason the United Kingdom can introduce vaccine today, when the vaccine was only uh, provided to an EUA in the United Kingdom last week, was because of the planning that has gone in, in terms of those countries being able to access vaccine at an early stage. When we hear uh, that South Africa hasn't even decided which vaccine they're going to actually decide on eventually. And right now, like I said, all of this vaccine has been taken up already. So we, they, we are worried about when we're gonna get vaccine simply because we don't know which vaccine we're gonna get, how much vaccine we're gonna get, who we're gonna get it from, where we're gonna get it from. And that is a problem. So right now, we're pretty much on the track to get a vaccine after the resurgence has occurred in South Africa. And what we already experienced the first time around is that in urban areas, heavily densely populated areas, up to one third of South Africans were already infected with the first wave. So we are vague, but the reason we're vague is because unfortunately the reality is we haven't already made a plan in terms of which vaccines we were going to purchase. And that was meant to be done at risk in that we were never gonna be able to know which vaccines were eventually going to work. But all of these high income countries, yes, they do have the luxury of having the resources to be able to do that. But they went out at risk a few months ago already when this vaccine started to go into human trials. That's when they already put their purchase orders in to access these vaccines. Uh, Professor Mpahlelia, I think um, you were called out there. Maybe you want to have a right of reply. No, thanks, uh, Tusha um, Clearly, it's not a dialogue. And uh, we're not defending anybody here. And uh, I think uh, the person who's supposed to be defending, um, this uh, is, is actually the government. Uh, so I can only, you know, say what I know. And um, obviously, uh, the government is listening. And, um, and Shabir can engage the government as well. So it's not really a criticism to me, but um, I take it that um, it's really an expression of uh, uh, his opinion on, 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 on the lack of uh, a plan at the moment. Uh, so point well taken. Thank you. And maybe I should say that we really don't have money in the country. Um, the money is stolen. Look at the Zondo Commission. So, you know, um, I, think, I think we actually need to consider all issues. Yes, we could have gone straight to, to put in orders, etc. But where are we going to get the money from? And it all comes back down to finances. So, unfortunately, we've had a very corrupt, you know, certain, uh, I mean, uh, a huge sector uh, of, uh, of our leadership at various levels have been absolutely corrupt. And, and this is one of the reasons we're sitting at the moment thinking about where are we going to get the money from? That's the reality. Dr. Kalyatanda, I think you want to talk. No, I mean, I, 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 I can't speak a lot about, um, w w you know, the, the, obviously the, the politics and what's happening in South Africa, but I think this, this pandemic really offers an opportunity for a lot of developing countries in the world um, to, to build, uh, to innovate. Um, capacity building, and and then also for local governments to invest in funding. And we 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 well, again, um, I I go back um, to India because we had a lot of participants from India, but uh, but the um, method with which they started building ventilators because and it became apparent early on during the pandemic that obviously a lot of um, um, lot needs to be done in terms of increasing the ICU capacity. There were lots of people who, who came up with innovations and, and, and I think the government did support them, but, but 
it was at a very grassroots level as well. Uh, and I've also seen a lot of uh, funding uh, going in, in in a lot of developing countries to, to innovate new products, um, drugs, various other things. So I think this, um, this pandemic really provides us all an opportunity to build. Uh, and, and I think um, that's what we should, we should uh, you know, kind of do and encourage as well. Thank you. Um, I'm reading another question from one of the members of the audience. Uh, how effective will the vaccines be? Will we need to take them every few months uh, or years? Um, what happens if we don't take the second dose? Some of the vaccines require you having two doses. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the effectiveness of the vaccine. Yeah, so Steve, currently our understanding in terms of these vaccines is most of the reports that have come out for the three vaccines indicate you need to get at least two doses of vaccine. Obviously, because the participants have been, haven't been followed up for a long period of time, we can't really predict in terms of how long the immunity is going to last. But that being said, there are some lessons to be learned from natural infection. And the data from natural infection uh, indicates now that uh, both in terms of what we call humoral immunity as well as cell-mediated immunity and the sort of memory cells that are induced by natural infection, it lasts for at least six to nine months. Uh, based on evidence with other common cold coronaviruses, uh, as well as the SARS and MERS uh, coronavirus, the immunity after natural infection is about two to three years. Now, what, the reason I'm talking about natural infections is that many of these vaccines have been evaluated in terms of the immune responses relative to what is induced by natural infection. And the type of immune responses that have been induced by these vaccines are similar, if not better, than what is induced by natural infection. So even though it's too early, it would be very surprising if the immunity doesn't persist for at least two to three years. For some vaccines, as, as an example, with the measles vaccine, immunity lasts for up to 15 to 20 years. Uh, this yellow fever vaccine where immunity probably is lifelong. So it's difficult to predict. And those are the type of questions that we would need to address moving forward. In terms of one versus two doses, like I mentioned right now, uh, the, there, is an, there is analysis that I'm aware of that's being done uh, to see what the efficacy, what the effectiveness of a single dose is, uh, at least for two of the vaccines. But it, I don't think uh, that I don't think that to the current evidence that we could recommend a single dose of the vaccine until such time when that evidence comes up. Uh, the, one of the reasons why we are unlikely to need to vaccinate each year, unlike seasonal influenza, is that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is relatively genetically stable. There are some mutations that take place, but nowhere to the extent as you see for seasonal influenza. So one of the main reasons we vaccinate each year for seasonal influenza is because of this antigenic, what we call an antigenic uh, shift uh, or drift that takes place uh, in terms of mutations, whereas that is not uh, necessarily and unlikely to be the case with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask one question now that the same question for all members of our panel, you each have an uh, opportunity to respond to it uh, from your own particular perspectives. Um, uh, the same, it's the same question for all members. Uh, the question is, what should South Africa be doing now? What's the way forward? Uh, Professor Dai, would you like to kick off? Yeah, no, that's, that's a difficult question, actually. Uh, but what should South Africa be doing now is I think we should actually be working towards equitable access to vaccines for all in our country. Um, and I think it's very, very important to remind ourselves that the pandemic has actually highlighted our inequities and even exacerbated our inequities. And, and we need to confront these inequities. And uh, in terms of the vaccine rollout, uh, you know, what should South Africa be doing? South Africa should be thinking about how we can actually move towards equitable access, how we can, uh, how we can try to secure vaccines uh, 
taking into consideration our South African realities. I think also we need to work on implementation. So, so getting the vaccine and securing the vaccine is one thing, prioritizing who should get the vaccine is another thing, but how do you implement? Uh, you know, it's very easy to implement uh, where I live, but how do you actually start implementing, especially if you have a second dose? How do you trace in some of the townships that we have? Which is sure basically takes the second dose. a large, yes, a large proportion of the country. You know, so I think we need to also look at how we go about implementing, which will ensure that we take into consideration our South African realities and deliver and make delivery of our second doses possible as well. So there is a lot to do. Thank you, Professor Dai. Okay. Uh, Professor Mpahleri, can I come to you next? What, where should we go to? What should we do now? Um, I was on mute. Um, so I, I, I agree uh, with Ames uh, on the points that she has uh, raised. And uh, maybe just to add that um, it is definitely important uh, that we need to finalize our plans uh, to secure the vaccines. And um, we hope uh, that uh, the government will really fast track this process. And uh, the other thing is that um, we should just uh, put all our ducks in a row uh, so that uh, when the vaccine is here, uh, we know what to do. And um, the message that I want to leave with the participants is the fact that we should not pin all our hopes on the vaccines because um, it will just be wrong to do that. Um, the vaccine will you know, solve part of the problem, but it's not going to give us solution to everything about the pandemic. So it's still very important uh, that uh, we adhere to the basics. Uh, so it doesn't mean that when the vaccine is here tomorrow, um, we're going to forget about the basics uh, in terms of uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions and uh, everything that we know, it works. Uh, so that is really an important message uh, that uh, we should remember. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kalyatanda, your, your opportunity. Yes, I, I completely agree. As I, I again, um, you know, I I think, you know, the the message shouldn't be that once the vaccines come out, everything is going to be okay the very next day. So I think we still have to do all those common sense things that that public health demands out of us: uh, distancing, caution. And then also at the same time, I think um, this gives us an opportunity to invest in public health, invest in building capacity um, in a lot of uh, nations. And so I think um, this, this would be a good starting point. Thank you. Professor Mahdi. Yeah, so Steve, I mean, I fully agree with what uh, other speakers have mentioned, uh, but when we think about vaccines and what needs to be done, what's of priority right now for South Africa is really to sort out how it's going to access vaccine with reasonable quantities. Uh, and I think as uh, Jeffrey has mentioned, the groups that would need to be prioritized in the context of limited doses of vaccine, those are well defined already. Uh, and we need to look at what systems, what are we going to use to be able to reach those groups over a short period of time. Uh, the point that Prof Dai mentions in terms of how expensive these vaccines are, we need to be clear that inaction on a part of the country in accessing these vaccines will be more costly than the amount that's required to actually purchase vaccines for the country. We already know that what happened this year round is that the receiver of revenue will have a 300 billion rand shortfall because of our response to COVID-19 in terms of lockdowns. Uh, when we are funding South African airways to 10 and a half billion rand in terms of getting them out of debt, and we're talking about not spending, we're complaining about spending two and a half billion rand on procuring vaccine for 10% of the population, there's a disconnect. So we need to be clear that vaccines cost and it's going to cost South Africa money. But like I said, the inaction and our inability to gain vaccine would be more costly 
than what vaccines would actually cost for South Africa to get at least about one third to 40% of our population vaccinated. So the priority for the country, all of whatever we're talking about is completely academic. If we don't have vaccine on the horizon and right now, South Africa as a country, unfortunately, does not have any sort of vaccine on the horizon, except for the 10% that might come to the COVAX facility sometime towards the end of the second quarter of 2021, which is not going to assist us in terms of the resurgence that is likely to be experienced in this country come February, March of next year. Thank you. And, and one quick last question. Um, one of the main goals of SciFest Africa, the SciFest Africa is hosting this webinar, and one of their main goals is to encourage robust debate and a more engaged citizenry when it comes to healthcare and science. So what should the citizens of the country be asking government? What should the citizens be asking policymakers, scientists and healthcare workers? Uh, open question. Anyone? Exactly the questions you are asking us. Uh, I think it's exactly the same question. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. Uh, I think the citizens have got the right uh, to demand uh, the vaccine and, um, and, 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 and they should um, just, you know, um, make their voice heard uh, that uh, a vaccine is needed. And, um, and, 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 and even though uh, the government can provide the vaccine, uh, they should also play their part, uh, as I mentioned, uh, that we need responsible citizenship. Uh, it's not like um, because you know the government will provide uh, the vaccine, um, we then going to neglect uh, everything else that we know is working. So that is really um, something that I can say. Yeah, I, I think it's very important that um, that uh, the government hears the citizenship. Um, I, I think it's important in terms of anything that the government is going to be doing with regard to the vaccines to, to promote legitimacy, to promote trust uh, in terms of uh, the South African uh, uh, populations. Um, you know, any vaccine, um, you know, and if trust is promoted, then when it comes to uptake of vaccines, I think if our citizens can take ownership of decisions, so not only what is government going to do, but how is government going to involve us in these decisions, then we take ownership of these decisions and we accept these decisions and we move with them. Thanks. Thank you so much. And with so many questions still outstanding, this has been a riveting discussion on matters of life or death importance. I would like to thank our panelists, Professor Shabir Mahdi of Wits University, Professor Ames Dai of the SAMRC, Professor Jeffrey Mpacheli, also of the SAMRC, and Dr. Gautam Kalyatanda of the University of Florida. This webinar was curate, curated by Professor Janice Limson, Vice Chair of the SciFest Africa Advisory Committee and the Department of Science and Innovation, NRF, Saatchi Chair in Biotechnology, Innovation and Engagement. Ryan Bruton was in control of the technical side of this webinar hosted by SciFest Africa. Your contributions have all been invaluable. And from me, your host, Stephen Lang, thank you for all your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.